Good morning, everybody. Happy Father's Day. Thank you very much. So a few things just to announce here this morning as we get going. So the first is, uh, so the fir- we, we have um, those of you that are online, welcome to everybody on Facebook. We appreciate you being with us. And uh, happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. Hopefully you're uh, going to have a blessed day. Uh, those of you, if you have guests with us this morning, we have a connection card close uh, by you on your seat. We just encourage you just to fill out that connection card and drop it in the offering plate at the, uh, at the back of the room here. Uh, and if you have a prayer request, also fill that out and drop it off there because we do pray for you during the course of the week. Okay? Uh, just a couple of things here. Uh, one is that we're putting some things together for the rest of the summer, some save the dates that you'll find actually in your bulletin. Uh, we have the church picnic scheduled for August 22nd. So if you are able to kind of put that, uh, that date aside, it's a Sunday, we're going to have it right here uh, at, at, the, uh, at the building here just to make it convenient and easier for folks. Uh, so that's coming up, as well as the fellowship committee is also just planning some additional things throughout the summer into the fall, just finding ways of being able to pull us together and to gather. So, uh, so if you would just take note of that uh, in your bulletin. And if you want to be able to be a part of the fellowship committee, They would love to be able to have some people to be able to sit with them in the committee. You could talk with either Stephanie Benzel or uh, Donna Hall. Neither one of the gals are here this morning. But if you want to say something to me, I'll make sure you could be put in touch with them. So they would love to have you. So today is uh, Barb and Dick D's anniversary of 53 years. They were actually supposed to have flowers here. So just pretend we have a huge bouquet of flowers. We want to appreciate them. So, um, so yeah, so that, so we appreciate you guys, f- and I'm sorry that that did not happen. But like I told them before, we'll give them some additional candy bars, going out the door, so they can. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna wait till after the service is over, so the sugar high doesn't hit them in the middle, and they start pacing back and forth in the back. So yeah, so okay, all right. So also, I'm gonna have uh, Barb, Barbara, come on up here. So Barb asked if she would be able to share a little bit of. Uh, a story of how God has touched her, and um, I absolutely want to do it because we always like to hear what God's doing. So, Barb. Well, this is, <coughs> thank you. Um, this is for both of my fathers in heaven and for you all to hear. Um, most of you don't know me. I'm Barbara Harvey Ziegler. Uh, My church closed in October of 2018, and I started coming here in um, uh, the spring of 2019. Um, And then, of course, we got, had COVID hit in 2020. June 29th of last year, I was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, uh, which was in the right lung and in several bones. And uh, I've had treatments, uh, I am currently on Keytruda and will remain on Keytruda for a couple of years. Um, radiation as well. And I also had uh, in my neck and my spine, uh, lower spine, um, some tumors. And those have all cleared up. And I saw my um, oncologist on June 17th, Dr. Wakushe, not even a year later. And uh, he is with Will Spann, and he told me that I had no active cancer. <laughs> Praise God. That is just so wonderful. And God just put it in my heart in the middle of the night to, to come up here and talk to you all this morning. So if you know anyone that has cancer, tell them there is hope. God is wonderful. And just pray and I mean, so many people have prayed for me. It, it's just amazing how wonderful everything has been. So thank you all very much. That's a great way to start the morning. What do you think, huh? So I just want to just kind of reiterate, just share a little quick here before we get started with the service, actually. So Barbara, when she, when she first found out, we talked on the phone. And uh, one of the things that Barb said is that I'm at peace. I'm at peace with God. And whatever he wants to do, I, I will follow him. 
And that was the, uh, our initial conversation, uh, just not knowing what was going to happen next. And so, and now we're um, a little more than a year later and see God has, has given her that new, new, new lease here. And so we just want to appreciate that. Thank you for sharing that. I think that really brings hope to a lot of us. So with that, let's all rise and let's uh, launch into service. Good morning. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And that's from Psalms 9, 1 and 2. Jesus, we love you and worship you. We dedicate our lives anew to you today. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. If we could just take a moment and just bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord and ask him if there's anything in our lives that's standing between us and him. Our Heavenly Father, in His infinite mercy, has sent His only Son into the world for your salvation, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. Therefore, by the authority of Jesus Christ and in His name, I declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all our fathers. The first reading is found in Job 38, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens my counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out upon the womb? When it made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Word of God, word of life. 
Our second reading is found in first, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend, commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but by your own, you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. Word of God, word of life. gospel is taken out of Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with, with them on the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, at the, on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one, one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. Here ends the gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated. So this morning, being Father's Day, so this goes back a few weeks, so Jill and I were kind of talking um, amongst ourselves, what should we do for Father's Day, right? And trying to, to figure this out. And so then um, Peter and Jubilee were all there, and then we were t processing, and they, they basically said, Jubilee and Peter said, why don't you let us preach? And I said, no way, <laughs> you know, because that could be a disaster, you know. So anyway, so as we were trying to process a little, uh, Kendra uh, Deal, who's going to be speaking this morning, uh, she's going to be actually speaking at a conference a little later on this week here. She had contacted me, which I've known Kendra for, for several years now, for I mean, almost 10 years now, I think it is. So we were just, we were t uh, she's an emailing back and forth, and she says, hey, if you want me to have come out a little early, I can speak on Father's Day somewhere, so whether it's uh, here at New Hope or elsewhere. And so I said, Jill, let's, what do you think about that? And she said, absolutely, go get her. So I said, okay. So Kendra Deal um, is the vice president of uh, innovation and spiritual formation at the Master's Institute in Minneapolis. And uh, actually, we're partnering, uh, LCMC, the Lutheran Congregations and Mission for Christ, whom New Hope uh, is, a, is a member of that, 
uh, partners with the Master's Institute to train up uh, pastors, whether they're going into a second career situation or somebody who's uh, coming along and says, hey, I really would like to try to consider the ministry as a, as a young person. And so they've been partnering with LCMC for quite a few years now. And, uh, and so Kendra is, um, is very involved in that and actually is uh, instrumental in, start in helping to start the Micro MDiv program, whom we're actually going to be uh, resourcing for, I think Vince for sure is, is jumping on that, as well as others are going to be connecting in with that, people that, again, want to pursue uh, ministry uh, in a more vocational manner. So, so Kendra, why don't you come forward? Let's appreciate Kendra this morning as she comes into the <laughs> Thank you, Jim. So I'm not sure um, the jury will be out for a while whether or not it would have been a better idea for Jubilee and Peter to be sharing the message this morning. But I said to Jim, I, I can come on either side of the conference. Whenever I'm traveling, I like to give pastors a break. They, we all need a break once in a while. And because I work in a seminary now as opposed to in a church congregation, I don't get to bring the word all of that often except to our students. And so it's just good to give pastors a break, and all the more on Father's Day, right? So, so Jim said, yeah, why don't you come out before the conference on Father's Day? So I said to my husband of 38 years, is it okay with you if I'm gone on Father's Day? And he said, well, I'm not your father. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, that works. So I have this idea. Will you guys play with me for just a moment? Yeah. If I video record you, will you say Happy Father's Day to my husband? Yeah. His name is Rob. Okay, you ready? Hold this up. Thank you so much. And I got this awesome chocolate bar after the first service. God bless fathers. I guess I scored just for showing up, right? I'm not sure it's going to make it all the way home, even though it says fathers. Just saying. So my husband and I, we have three children, and they are adults. So we also have three beautiful um, children in loves. That's what I like to call them, because I don't like the law thing. Children in law sounds just so contractual as opposed to relational family, you know. So I call them children in love, and, um, and we have three beautiful grandsons. So I will be calling everybody today to say Happy Father's Day, except I might skip my husband because he's not my father. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm really happy to be with you. I'm happy to be with you in part because this is my old stomping grounds. Um, my father was raised in southern New Jersey, and when I was born, he was a pastor, and he pastored in Philadelphia, and then for a little while back across the Delaware into New Jersey. And my aunt lived in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania for, oh my goodness, probably 40 years at least. So we used to catch fireflies in her front yard when we would come out to visit. Growing up in New Jersey, uh, fireflies were the big deal, right? Who catches? You guys probably don't still catch. You've gotten so used to them. Um, fire, so fireflies evidently don't like Minnesota. I don't know why. We might see one or two every occasionally, but where I grew up in Pittman, New Jersey, there was a house just at the end of the block that for some reason was the house that fireflies liked. And so we would go to the other end of the block with our little glass jars. Remember the mason jars that you sent children out to catch fireflies in? And catch fireflies in, and we'd catch 20, you know. So dear, dear memories of this space. I did a little Snoop Dogg on you in preparation for coming. I always like to pray in advance, Lord, um, tell me about the people that I'm going to be with. And, and then I looked on your website, and your website tells a lot of really wonderful things about your heart. And you, probably being a part of this community, don't go on your own website very often to read what it says about you. So I'm here to stir you up and remind you of what your website says is the heart that God has placed in you as lovers of God. So on your website, it tells a little bit of your backstory, how you became New Hope Communi Faith Community Church, and that you had some tragedy in 2016 that really shocked you, and you had an interim pastor for a while, and then in 2018, you called Pastor Jim. And so here's what it says after explaining that backstory. Over the next two years, New Hope Faith Community 
made big decisions to prepare for the next phase of existence. A new 40 by 60 building was built and used as a sanctuary. The congregation was affiliated with LCMC and new dreams are being dreamed to reach the next generation for Christ. New dreams are being dreamed to reach the next generation for Christ. And I see some of you nodding your heads. Yes, that's right. That's the dream. What a beautiful dream. That's God's dream. It's not just your dream. That's God's dream. And the Lord does this for us over and over and over again. The Lord puts his dream in our hearts to make God's purposes happen upon the earth. And so I don't know how often you stop to think about that, but when you dream God's dreams, chances are about 100% that if you're serious about this dream, it's going to happen because it's God's dream in you, and the Lord has a way of making this happen. Now, um, last night, this doesn't happen to me very often when I'm getting prepared to speak someplace, but last night I had a nightmare. I would call it a nightmare. It's a pastor kind of nightmare where in your dream you are running late and you forgot your message. So I didn't have my notes. I was running late, and I'm asking the Lord, in my, this is my dream, I'm asking in the Lord, um, what do you want me to share? And the Lord says, talk about Luke chapter 9. So when I woke up, I'm like, huh, I wonder what's in Luke. I said, I actually said to the Lord, do you want me to preach on Luke chapter 9? And, and um, the Lord said, no, that was just your dream. Okay, but I was curious anyway. So I went to Luke chapter 9. And Luke chapter 9 at the beginning is, the, is um, where Jesus sends out the 12. And he sends out the 12 and he gives them power to do all the things that they had been seeing Jesus do. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, and proclaim that the kingdom of God is here. It has come among you. And they do. The 12 go out. They go out to the tribes of Judah, and they preach, and they minister, and glory falls, and healings happen, just like De uh, Barbara's ha healing. Where's Barbara? Where did you go? There she is. Thank you, Barbara. I'm a cancer survivor, too. Healing happens. Praise God. And they come back and they say, wow, it works. It, it almost sounds like in the scripture text, like they're surprised. I would be surprised. I mean, I've seen Jesus do it, but uh, he's Jesus. I would be surprised about that. But the very next passage in the, in the Luke gospel text is the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus sits down to teach on the hilltop. And, and the disciples come to him and go, um, I think we have a problem here. We've got all these people, and what are we going to do? They've come a long way to see you, and they're gonna, we don't have food. We don't, we, like, what are we going to do? And Jesus says, well, well, do something. And they're like, uh, 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 mm. And Jesus says, okay, what have we got? And he makes it happen again. So they had just been sent out doing all of these amazing things, and, and they've already forgotten. Now, I like to say, because I'm from Minnesota, where it's 20 below zero in the winter, that human beings, we leak. Christians leak. Like, the Lord fills us up, and it just kind of leaks out like a, a tire on a Minnesota day. You know, the air just kind of leaks out of these tires, and your tires get flat because it's so cold. Now, you guys wouldn't know that, but that's how it works in Minnesota. That we leak. They had already leaked. They had already forgotten that that's what God does through them. And here you are with your vision to be, to be dreaming new dreams for Jesus Christ. And it says this. New dreams are being dreamed to reach the next generation for Christ. We want to be living expressions of Jesus Christ. Go wherever he sends us. Make followers of Jesus Christ to love and to obey. Wow. Just let that settle in you for a moment. How beautiful, how powerful is that? 
living expressions of Jesus Christ, to go where he sends us, to make followers of Jesus, to love and to obey. You know, scripture is full of dreams. Uh, some of my favorite happened right away in the book of Matthew. And if you remember, it, for those of you who are familiar with scripture, and if you're not, go home and look it up because it's pretty cool. In Matthew, it opens with a whole bunch of dreams. Joseph is having dreams. Um, Simeon is having dreams. Dreams all over the place. And the Lord is leading them through these dreams, speaking to them and helping them find where God, the center of God's will is for them. Dreams are familiar in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, but there was 400 years of silence in between. And all of a sudden, dreams are busting out all over the place. And God is beginning to stir those up so that he is preparing for the kingdom of God to come upon earth in the name of Jesus Christ. But today, God is pre preparing through your dreams for the kingdom of God to come upon the earth through you. I don't know if that's intimidating for anybody. It is for me. It's intimidating for me to think, just like the disciples in Luke chapter 9, uh, 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 it, it, yeah, it worked once, but what's the chance that it's going to work again? Like, if I show up, am I going to look like a fool? God stirs these things, not so that you can do it, but so that God can do it through you. Jesus tells his disciples when he is getting near to the point of his death that he is going to be going away and that's a good thing. Now, that did not sound like a good thing to any of them. I'm going away. This is a good thing. But Jesus knew that it was because the Holy Spirit was coming and they had no context for that. So it didn't sound like a good thing for them. But when the Holy Spirit came, suddenly, bam, miracles start happening all over the place. It's like Luke chapter 9 again, only without Jesus on the scene, because the Holy Spirit is on the scene. And so the power of God is continuing to stir up dreams and visions for what God wants to do upon the earth. And he's invited you to be a part of it. Wow. Does anybody want to, like, get super excited about that? I don't know if you're a happy clapping kind of people, but I think that deserves a round of applause for Jesus. That's what the Lord wants to do through each of you. And I don't want you to forget that. I want you to take a moment with the Lord and say, I want what you want, Lord. I want the dreams that are on your heart. I want to be a part of of what you are doing, what you are accomplishing upon the earth. Now, for every single one of us, it's going to be a bit of a unique experience. Cloning is still illegal, and I hope it stays that way, because we as parents, or we as mentors, or we as leaders, or we as good friends, are not supposed to be cloning ourselves. But we are supposed to be making little Christs. That's what Christian means. Did you know that? Christian means little Christs, that you will be like Christ, that you will have the mind of Christ, that you will do the things of Christ, that you will live a life of Christ upon the earth. And when the disciples were sort of arguing over who was going to be the first in the kingdom of God, who was going to sit on Jesus' right hand and who was going to sit on Jesus' left, in John chapter 13, he dons a towel and gets a water basin and he takes the lowest position of the lowest servant and washes their feet. And that's what God's dream looks like, that we would love and that we would serve like Jesus does. There is a passage in Scripture out of the Old Testament that I find uh, particularly inspiring when I think about participating with God in the work of God upon the earth. And it comes from Exodus chapter 3. Now, let me set the story for you if there are a few of you that aren't familiar with Scripture. 
The Bible is God's story to us, for us to be able to understand who God is, how God works, what God invites us into, the character of God and the character of humanity, and the freedom and the liberty that comes from knowing God and being free in Jesus Christ who gave his life for us so that we might have life. Life today and life eternal. We're not just talking about that someday kind of life. We're talking about right here, right now, that Jesus Christ wants us to live upon the earth and empowers us to do that through his spirit's presence. And that is a partnership. I find that a bit intimidating, that the king of the universe wants to partner with me to accomplish God's purposes upon the earth until I remember that it's not about me. It's about what God wants to do and what God is going to empower to do. And if you heard from Barbara's testimony, she had friends who were praying. You know what they were doing? They were participating with what God wanted to do in Barbara's life. That's what prayer is. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What God is doing and, and asking to be accomplished on the earth in heaven, bring it here. Let me be a part of it. That's what that is. And there's this passage in Exodus chapter 3 that I just love. And this is the life of Moses. Now, for those of you that may not be familiar with Moses, I'll do you a quick catch-up. Moses was the baby in the basket because Pharaoh was killing all of the boy babies. Well, actually, were killing all the children, the Jewish Israelite children. They were called Israelites at the time. That was long before they were called Jews. And Moses' mom wanted to save him because she could sense that there was something special about him. So she wove this basket together and she placed him in the river right at about the time that she knew Pharaoh's daughter was going to come down. And sure enough, she found the basket and she saw how beautiful the baby was and she decided she wanted to keep him for herself and he was raised in Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's palace. All of the best, the best education, the best food, the best living circumstances, the best clothes, like all of the best that he had as this Israelite child. And one day he got curious and he went out to um, check on his own people because he knew he was an Israelite. And he discovered that they weren't being well treated. And so in his discovery, he became enraged and a soldier was pounding on one of the Israelites and Moses took the fence and killed the soldier. And now the Israelites are afraid of him and perhaps Pharaoh's soldiers are after him. And so the next day he runs scared. And he runs a very long way because Egypt is a large country. He runs to a country called Midian. And in Midian, he becomes a shepherd of his father-in-law's flock. So he meets a girl, he marries a girl in Midian. Uh, most Hebrew scholars, by the way, think that she was black. So this biracial thing that's happening around here is not new. Just want to say that. And um, because that's the culture of Midian even in the ancient Near East. So he is working as a shepherd for his father-in-law's flock, which is not cool. Like culturally, that is not cool. By now, he should be raising his own flocks. By now, if, there, if anything, if he's working for anybody, it would be for his own father because that was dignified. But for your wife's dad, not cool. So he's gone from Pharaoh's palace to not cool. Okay, can we agree with that? Not cool. Okay. So he's out with his fox and sees this bush that starts to burn, but it's not burning up. And so curiously, he goes over to check this out, and he discovers that, lo and behold, this strange event is occurring, and a voice speaks to him, and it's God's voice. How on earth? Did he know that was God's voice? He was raised in Pharaoh's palace as a son of Pharaoh who had run from God. How did he know that was God's voice? I love this idea because evidently it didn't really matter. It didn't really matter because God has a way of making God's self known to us. That 
is so encouraging to me. Because I want to hear God's voice. I want to hear God speak to me. And I want to know that it's the right voice. And the Lord says this to Moses. After telling him who he is, that he is God, he says in verse 7, this is Exodus 3, verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry, and on account of their taskmasters, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. I get chills over this story. Because here's what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying, I have heard their cries. I have come down and I have seen. And I am sending you. Do you see the partnership in this? I am sending you. And I will be with you. Now this is a demonstration of the character of God. The character of God never changes. All the way through scripture, all the way through eternity, when we see God's character, we know what to expect of God, particularly as we see in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. If you would have any questions about how we see God or understand God in the Old Testament, that's another sermon, by the way. So anyway, so the Lord says, I have heard, I have seen, I have come down, and I am sending you, and I will be with you. This is a word that we need for ourselves today. Because the Lord is calling, and you know it. I see it on your website, that you are dreaming the dreams, that you want to live the full expression of Jesus Christ alive in you. And this is how we do it, because the Lord has seen, the Lord has heard, the Lord is coming down. In fact, the Lord has come down in Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Lord is sending you, and the Lord is with you. Now, for those of you that are older, this is what I call spiritual parenting. And everybody needs a parent. Hopefully, they get a good parent. But spiritual parents who live like this, spiritual parents who, who agree with the Lord to be sent on behalf of the Lord to make a difference in the kingdom, like your website says, this is spiritual parenting. Whether you've ever been a biological parent or not, this is God's kingdom word to you. Spiritual parents, rise up. It doesn't matter whether you're scared or intimidated or say, who am I? That's what Moses did. Who am I? That's what the, that's what the Jesus disciples did, even after they performed all of those miracles. Who am I? Uh, 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 gee, mm. And the Lord keeps empowering again and again and again. The Lord is okay with that. And so I want to say to you, look around. Who is the Lord going to put on your heart uniquely? Somebody who's hurting, somebody who's lost, somebody who's confused, somebody who needs love, who needs service, somebody that the Lord has highlighted for you, each of you uniquely. This happens all the time, all the time. And you might not even know that they see you like that. At the seminary, um, everybody has to be on campus three times a year. And so they come in from different parts of the country. And, uh, and there are a few of, of the young women in the seminary that I am particularly close to. And so one was coming in from Atlanta. And I picked her up at the airport. And, um, and I secretly had arranged for two of the other young seminary women that she is very close to to join me. 
So when we picked Ashley up at the airport, her friends were in the car and it was like, ah, girlfriend time, girlfriend time, you know. And, um, and we went to a special spot in our city for a while and then we went over to my house and had dinner. And they were reminding me of what, this was their language, spiritual mother, I am to them. And I was surprised, that's my point, I was surprised. I had no idea that they saw me that way, but here's who a spiritual parent is. A spiritual parent is someone who knows it's not about them, that this is what the Lord has called you to. A spiritual parent sees the privilege of raising up a spiritual child in the kingdom of God. A spiritual parent, just like it says on your, on your program, oops, there goes my phone from videotaping my husband, on Proverbs 20, 22, you're on the front of your program here, it says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Do you know what that means, literally? It means train up a child in the unique way that they should go. Not do it my way or the highway, parents, or spiritual parents. You're not cloning yourself. You're creating a new, unique being in the image of Jesus Christ. A spiritual parent knows and sees the things that God sees in that person and helps call it forth. A spiritual parent is one who don't, doesn't only give birth but continues to give life, continues to give training, continues to get equipping. Brothers and sisters, this is who we are. And if you are young and you're not that yet, I'm sure you feel the hunger and the need to be parented in that way. People see something special in each one of you, and they want what you have. Give it away freely. Pray about, Lord, who are my people that you want me to be walking aside, alongside, that you want me to be loving, that you want me to be bringing to life. The Lord says, I have heard I have seen, I have come down, I am sending you, I am with you. I want to leave you with one playful image from my grandson Levi. He's our oldest, and um, he's almost eight now, but when Levi was three, I was in, they were living in California at the time, and I was out there to help take care of their newborn baby and Levi uh, while my daughter was at work. She's a hospital chaplain. And um, so Levi said, Nana, can I go outside and water the flowers? Well, Levi loved to water the flowers. They were probably a little too watered. And it was drought. It is Southern California after all. But um, I said, yes, you may. Can I use the hose, Nana? I said, no, you can't use the hose, but you can fill it up with the bucket and then very gently just pour a little bit on each plant. Okay, so out he goes. So Levi has just started to water the flowers at about the same time that his mama comes home. And she drives a Prius, and if you know what a Prius is, it's very, very quiet. It's like stealth. You can't even hear it running sometimes. So she pulls into the driveway, and Levi doesn't even know she's there. And she is watching from her seat in the front seat of the car what Levi is doing out in front of her in the backyard. And Levi is doing this. Pull this out. Levi is doing this. He's got a bucket. And he leans down and he waters, puts a little bit of water on that plant, and he steps back and he says, grow, little plant, grow. Grow big, grow strong, just like me. And then he goes to the next plant, he pours a little bit of water on it, and he steps back and he says, grow, little plant, grow. Grow big, grow strong, just like me. And he goes to the next one, same thing, next one, same thing. Here's the image for you. Of course, we thought it was adorable and hilarious at the time, but here's the image. It's a lasting image. This is who you get to be, regardless of your age. You get to see in other people and walk alongside them as they grow. Grow big, grow strong, just like me. It's Christ in you that does that. It's not cloning. It's not making them in your image. It's helping them to grow big and strong in the power and the life of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. 
Good and gracious God, we love you so much. Thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for the power of your call. We thank you, Lord, that you have seen, that you have come down, that you are sending us. Bless us, Lord, to be partners with you, dreaming the dreams that you dream, the expression of Jesus Christ on the earth to love and to obey. I ask these things in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Your spirit can do this in us. And so we stand in faith and hope in Jesus' name. Amen. share together in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge.
God, the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Amen. God, help our church body to walk in a manner worthy of the calling you have given us. Help us in all our interactions with one another to have humble and gentle hearts. Grant us patience for one another, bearing with one another in love. Grant the body of Christ unity. May we walk humbly with you, God, allowing you to show us our wrongs. Amen. Lord, your word speaks promises of healing and restoration, and we thank you for the miracles you still perform today. We believe in the healing power of faith and prayer, and we ask you to begin your mighty work in the lives of, just go ahead and speak those folks out that you don't need prayer today. Lord Jesus, please reach and down and surround them with supernatural peace and strength and give them the faith to believe that all things are possible for you. you uh, go ahead and be seated and go ahead and prepare your communion. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat, for this is my body, broken for you. Let's take together. After the supper, he took the cup. He gave it to his disciples again. He said, take and drink, for this is my blood poured out for you and for all mankind for the remission of your sins. Do this as often as you meet together in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink together. Let's share together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. By participation in the body and the blood of Christ, you have blessed us to be a blessing to those around us in the fellowship of your church, in our families, among our friends, and even our enemies. Receive our sincere thanksgiving for your forgiveness and your grace through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our benediction is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it.
God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Go in peace and serve the Lord. 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 Go in peace and serve the Lord